All right. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is the fourth and final school year 1920. Um, we've been down a long road. Normally, we do these sessions in one one swoop, half a day is what we've been doing. But this time, we wanted to take a lot more time and really break down and drill down into the core priorities so we as staff have direction in when we're preparing the budget. So before we get into the final wrap-up session, I just wanted to kind of highlight some things that we're doing and then turn it over to Quint so he can really take what we've done over the last three so we can get moving forward with our budget. So just a quick overview of our budget process. We are already in the preliminary development stage. Uh, Brandy works with us starting in like February, March to get us going on the annual budget. We usually give a, a, a direction, keep your budget flat, 1% uh, decrease in operational, things like that. We want to get away from doing that. We really want to get to where we're looking at our strategies and goals and then developing our budget that way. We originally were going to, the reason this, this meeting was scheduled at 1 o'clock, we were going to roll right into our budget workshop originally. However, there are some things, major things that we needed to have for that meeting that we, we didn't get in time. So we postponed it to July 9th, which actually gives us a, a little bit more time to focus on the strategic planning today, and then we can take what we learned today and then, and then translate it into the budget. The goals of the budget workshop, we're going to set the proposed millage rate for fiscal year 20. Um, as of right now, we, we are preparing the budget, assuming that the millage is going to stay the same. And then we're also going to highlight all those items in the budget that have a major impact, um, which, which I'll go over in a minute. We can then have additional workshops in August if we need to. In years past, we usually have at least one in August, but it'll all really depend on uh, input that we receive from you. And then we have our two budget hearings in September to formally adopt the budget, and our fiscal year starts October 1st. So some important topics to discuss, and we've, we've kind of gone over some of these during this, this process. Big one is pay and class study. You know, we've talked about the employees and how important they are to, to the success of our city. Um, we've never really focused on investing in employees. We've looked at equipment, sustainability through vehicle replacement, uh, capital projects, things like that. We're, we're trying to shift the focus because we've started to see a lot more turnover recently um, in some key departments. And we want to, you know, we don't want to become a training ground because that, in the end, it doesn't look like it costs you a lot of money up front, but in the long run, it, it actually does. And then enhanced public safety services. We've got some ideas to enhance police and fire that uh, we'll go over in that meeting. And, and, and I think you'll be, you'll be pretty happy with those ideas. And then the other thing is the half cent surtax. As you know, that was passed last November. We started uh, collecting it January 1, and really we've just been putting it in the bank, um, getting ready to bring some projects forward so we can at least get started on some of the preliminary planning phases. Employee benefits, that's probably the, the unknown, and that's the, really the thing that's out of our control. Um, last year, I think we saw a 10% increase in, in insurance. This year we're probably looking six to eight percent, and we're we're looking all kinds of ideas and out out of the box um, ways to try to reduce those costs. And then of course we're going to set the proposed millage rate. So some of the major projects we've discussed briefly already, we've actually had workshops that have highlighted some of these things. You've given us direction on where you want to go with some of these projects, but the downtown master plan, which which is a key project for us it's it's really already in motion we just got to start phasing in the implementation landing renovations that project is is moving um, first bid package is ready to go out uh, that construction should start somewhere late August early September commerce technology park master plan we just had a workshop on that along with the CRA plan so you you've heard all of that you know those are all pretty high dollar projects Downtown master plan was over 30 million. Landing is 5 million. And then your commerce technology park is closer 40, 50 million dollars to do everything. Um, as you know, we don't have that. We, would ha we will have to phase that in or, you know, 
plan it out accordingly. But um, they're all great projects. We just got to prioritize where we want to go. And then, of course, enhanced public safety, half cent sales tax, and the pay and class study implementation. So Quint wanted me to give an update on the community dashboard. That was something we really focused on at the last meeting. We, from that meeting, there was a recommendation to form a task force. Um, at one of the last council meetings, um, council approved the formation of that task force, and we actually had our first meeting on June 6th. At that meeting, we took the list that we had group discussions on at the last meeting, where we had 14 different categories of metrics. We were able, as a group of seven, to reduce that down to four core groups um, or categories. And we've got public safety, quality of life, efficient government, and economic development or growth. Um, what we did from there is we assigned teams of two to take on each of these, one of these categories. And each person is supposed to bring back five metrics per, you know, whatever their assigned category was. We're going to try to limit, limit it to 10 or less per category to start out with, but um, we'll see where it goes. It's definitely a dynamic dashboard. It's not going to be something that's set in stone from the beginning and never changes. Next meeting is actually this Thursday. Um, we're going to discuss the, the list of metrics and, and, and try to finalize that. We've been looking at templates. We've looked at San Diego, Fort Collins, Dallas. They've all got different templates, different um, setups. We, we just got to decide what's best for us. You know what's neat here is when you look at the cities that do it, they're normally much bigger than you. And I think it's pretty cool. I think you're, you're going to be one of the leaders. Let me turn this on. I tell you, when you, you look at a dashboard, there's very few governments that have it in Florida or even in the country. Now the big ones do more and more. So I think it's pretty exciting where you're going to be and I think it's excited for your community. And I think the other thing you mentioned, Michael, one time is you are part of something that you're going to be able to compare yourself to other communities too. So your dashboard, because many times we perform better than the community knows we perform. Sometimes we don't. But at least the dashboard will let you know how you do, where you're doing well, um, and where you can do better. I was telling Michael yesterday, I was in a, some meetings and you know people like to get up and sort of make some real general comments without sometimes all the facts, everybody and so on. So this will give you some good objective measurements that I think um, to be, you're to be commended as a community to be going this route. And really we've got a pretty aggressive timeline. We want to meet, try to formulate a recommendation to council in August or September and try to roll this thing out in October. Um, not sure how doable that is, but that's that's what we're shooting for. It all to post it online. Um, it'll be real important, Doug, for you to have a communication plan on this to the community. Why we're doing it, how we, you know, I, I would call it a, a pilot year one, because I think when you call it pilot, people are a little more forgiving, <laughs> really. And you're learning. I would call it a pilot. We're piloting this year one. See how it's going. What we can learn from it. We can adjust it. But I think, Doug. Um, you're rolling it out, the why, the what, and the how is going to be really a, important. And, and get a win. I mean, that, that's the challenge. Sometimes we, we, we run to losses, but we, we don't maximize the win because we just think it's, that's how we do business. I think this is a great win for Fort Walton. Yeah. And as I said, it's a dynamic dashboard. So whatever we come up with initially, we can change on the fly. Um, you know, we're doing a quality of life survey. And we, we, we haven't set the timeline for that yet, but if we get that done around the same time, we can use that input to maybe, cr you know, craft or change up our dashboard. But, you know, all, all these items that we've been discussing over the last few months are all starting to come together. And they're going to give not only us, but our citizens a great tool to really see how, how well we're doing. And Doug, I get um, Quality Life Survey, I think, again, rolling that out why, what you plan to do with it, because it's an expense. You know, these things are, you know, they're what they are. And you're going to, but I think the data and how to use it and, and what you can find out. And, and many times, remember, this is the community's perception. So sometimes it's, hey, we're not, we have to communicate better. Sometimes we have to fix some things, but hopefully you, you'll get a lot of wins, because Mason Dixon will also be able to sort of tell you how you compare to other communities and, and some of those things. So I think rolling this out, 
I just think for how you roll these out is, a, is really vital. And so really, next we just go, I just wanted to briefly go back over the core services that we discussed way back in, during the first session. And if you remember our leadership team, which is myself and the directors, um, we had come up with nine different core services and seven of those nine we felt were absolutely necessary to, uh, to serve our citizens. And then what we did is we also polled council and you, basically you came up with very similar core services. We didn't really get to the prioritization part and that's what Quint is gonna discuss today. But really the two that I'd like to highlight are really public safety that seemed to be on everybody's list you know figuring out where we need to be with them uh, enhancements things like that and then the other thing is employee retention um, as I said earlier we we've had a a lot of it, it seems like turnover is getting higher and higher um, and you know we hear various reasons we do exit interviews but it seems a lot of its pay and benefits and so that was why we we decided to do a pay in class study um, to really see where we stood versus our competitors. And you know, we're not talking about Tallahassee or Orlando or anything like that. We're talking local Northwest Florida, Pensacola, Niceville, Crestview, you know, other fire departments, things like that. So we're still waiting on the final draft or final report for that to really tell us where we're at. But I think those two items are really, really somewhere that that you know, based on what we've heard. From, from the group really seem to be the, the two points. Um, but there's a lot of other things on here that, that you know, we, we really need to, I think we need to leave today with kind of an, an idea which direction we want to move in. So with that, Quint? Can you leave that one up there? Sure. And, and, and turnover is such a tough thing. Like you say, you, I, I was so wrong. I'll finish that story. When I, when I was in healthcare for a while, I was actually pretty pleased um, when we'd lose a nurse. So we'd lose an RN that was maybe been there a long time and making this much an hour. And then, of course, we could hire a brand new grad at about 70% of what we were paying them. And the first thought is, well, this is good. Turnover is good because we're saving money until research came out and said, well, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're saving money on one thing, but we have more infections, you know, more other issues that, that come up. So I think those tie together quite well. Um, we talked about your mission statement, and I think almost everything you're doing with the dashboard has to, you know, get up into this. I think when you look at, I was talking to Michael earlier, um, people ask me, do you prefer the strong mayor form of government, or do you prefer the city manager? form of government. So like the one question you get as I talk to places and I say it really depends on who's the mayor and who's the city manager. <laughs> you know I, I've seen some really good cities with a good mayor and I've seen some terrible ones. You see some cities with the city manager that run well and you see some of them that don't. Um, the, the advantage of a strong mayor is normally the economic end of it. They tend to come in and they focus a lot on the economic development and growth. Um, they also sometimes aren't as good in operations. So then you have that, that operation issue. With the city manager form of government, the challenge is a manager's almost gear set is to manage expenses. Not, not to grow revenue, but to manage expenses. So with the city manager form of government, what you get many times is a, a better expense management but you might not get the economic growth. And I think where Michael's sort of a hybrid is I think Fort Walton is very fortunate because I think you've got a city manager that understands the managing expenses but understand you have to grow. Now there's different ways to grow. You can raise taxes to grow revenue, but probably the best way to grow is create new taxpayers, grow your population, grow, get new investment, and um, those types of things. We did a, project talking to James Lima who's an economic placement expert on um, 
just some basic stuff. If you do certain things, how much tax revenue that will increase. And, and I think that's where Fort Walton's at. You know, how do you grow the top line a little bit so you can continue to do these things um, to separate yourself from other communities? Because you're, com you're competing for employees, you're competing for tourists, you're competing for residents, you're competing for everybody, and those are your values. So we can go to mine, I guess. So what we wanted to do today is really update the dashboard. You're, you're there, and I think that's really vital. That, that what we wanted to do with this plan is not, not so much say this is the parking lot, this is where trees go. That's what you should decide. We, we wanted to basically say, what are some elements and structural that you can put in? Because you, you have a strategy, and your strategy is actually, you, you just mentioned it. You want to have a downtown plan. You want to do, do, do the landing, and you want to do your tech park. Now, the, the, that's your strategy. Now, the question is, as Michael said, how do you sequence it, and do you get the bang for the buck uh, out of it? And I'm sure somebody's put in, when you do these things, what your tax revenue will increase, what your population will increase, and so on. We want to talk about update a little bit, and, and I think, Terry, you're going to talk about what, what turnover cost. Because it's easy to say turnover cost, but there's some numbers you can say, what does it cost? And bad news is I talk to a lot of cities across the Northwest Florida. Everybody's trying to fix employee engagement. You know, everybody's looking at compensation right now. So, so this won't get you ahead. You just got to figure out how, how to do it. But I do feel better about what you're doing because most of them don't measure employee engagement. So they always just turn to comp. You know, big thing is always compensation, compensation, compensation. But you can have good compensation, but if you got the wrong manager, you're going to still have turnover. So, so the good news is you do have measured Terry. You, you've measured employee engagement for how long? Uh, since I've been here anyway, and um, it's, it's at least six years. And, so, probably and you do exit sir, exit yes, interviews. Sir. So you sort of know: is it a manager issue, or is it a true compensation and benefit issue? Talk about budget and agree with some strategic goals. So we talked about this in the beginning, and I think you, your mission, your vision, your strategy fits this. You've got to have effective government, and you're going to be able to measure that. You're going to be able to measure that objectively through the dashboard, and you're going to be able to measure it somewhat subjectively through your quality. It's quite sort of a subjective, and people give their own perception, but when you measure it up, you get an objective feedback on where, where do people feel. Do not be surprised if you start out a little less than you, you thought, because it's the first time people filling out the survey. So sometimes, I don't know, employee engagement survey, if that's how you started six years ago. But the first time you do a quality of life survey, you, you might be a little surprised at the results. I, I hope not, but I don't think when we did our first one in Pensacola, everybody was prepared to be in tw only 23% of the people think we're moving in the right direction. Um, today, it's much higher. Civic engagement is, is the hardest one, I think, on this list. It's how do you get the employees, or the, the, the city, the people, to truly understand what you're trying to do, to get engaged, to be, be part of the decision-making process, or certainly the input process. Um, how to educate them. So for example, if you start along downtown, which is very common today, to put plazas in. You know, most are doing it temporarily. They figure this thing out. They take some parking spots and they put some planters or cones for a while, see how it works, and then eventually if it works, then they start moving them. Or if you slow down traffic, which is happening, um, you know, all sorts of things are happening now because as people want more walkability. But for some people, they still want to drive faster to places. Now, the old way to do economic development, by the way, is say if we add a lane, people will get to work faster, so they'll work more hours, and that's an economic development. The problem is that's not true. Just because you get to work faster, there might not be the hours. So you know, that, that's that flexibility of getting the, the community at least understanding when you make the change. And you have a chance with the Quality of Life Survey. That's a great civic engagement. Because you're going to get the feedback. You're going to roll it out. You're going to roll it out and have town hall meetings on it. So that, that'll really, you know, it's nice to have a project to spur that. And then, of course, intelligent growth. So it's not grow just for growth, as, as we know. You can grow by putting a lot of cul-de-sacs in. But is, you've got to do some things that pay more taxes than a cul-de-sac, because they're hard to sustain. 
um, that they're just hard to sustain because they don't have the tax revenue to cover some of the expenses. Um, I thought this was pretty interesting. I, I, um, this is just sort of we took all the circles and put them into sort of what, what does this look like? What does intelligent growth look like? You know, it's community culture. It's using your public space as well. And public spaces, by the way, I, I think this is interesting. I know we've talked about this. The landings is public space, right? That works if you can get a whole bunch of stuff around it that pays taxes. So if you can put a landing in, which leads to maybe an apartment building, um, you know, other things just besides people coming down there to wreck, that, then it makes sense. But to put and spend a lot of money on public space, yeah, it's going to improve quality of life, but, but you've got to pay for it. And I think it will. I mean, I, I was telling Michael about a month ago, I was your, your downtown, and it was different than it was six months before that. You know, you, you can see there's some energy starting to c come into. And if you do the right things, you get tours. People that live there all the time, th that, that's what builds tourism. And of course, you want to have the job growth, particularly mm -hmm. for young people. Um, who, whoever wins in talent wins. This, this is the first time that um, talent, capital is filing talent. In the old days when you, my, my dad worked at General Motors. Um, I, worked, I taught at a school district in Janesville, Wisconsin. They had a big 7,000 employee GM plant. Now, if you were a teacher, you'd say, Ugh. kids aren't studying, let's go work at the GM plant and probably make more than all our teachers. <laughs> um, that plant is no longer exist. It's shut down. So the challenge today is most of us don't have those big places you can go to. They don't have that big company you can go to. So creating that entrepreneur ecosystem becomes very important. And that's what a downtown can help you create, from co-work space to different lease property to, to keep young talent home. So in prioritization, this is some of the earlier prioritizations that you talked about. Um, and we'll go over those as, as we move through here. And that was what you, you talked about, effective government. You know, you, you have a few things, and I don't have Michael's, but you have a few things that aren't must-haves that you do. I mean, you run a cemetery, right? That's not normal. Okay, for, for a city to do. It's just not normal. You know how these things happen. Somebody has to come run it. They come to the city, and somebody said, we, we can do it, and then you're in the cemetery business. Um, most cities today um, aren't excited about having golf courses. I mean, they're really not. They're, nobody's fighting for golf courses. And I know that because I own one. So I'm not just, I'm talking from, from um, experience. We have kids up in Wisconsin, and the, the Lake Mills Wisconsin golf course was in trouble. So we were stunned at how little you had to pay to buy a golf course. So we bought it, and we're tr we want to sell it. <laughs> and a broker told us, nobody's buying golf courses right now, at least in Wisconsin. Um, so then the question comes, if you have certain things that aren't, and these aren't part of your must-haves, wh what do you do with them? Because if they're not an asset you can sell, do you shut them down? Or do you keep them but figure out, are we the right ones to run them? Is there the most cost-effective way to do it? So I'm not saying you don't. I just think you've got to realize you are spending some money on some entities that aren't that take a little more management time, and you do it, which is wonderful for the community. I think it's great that Fort Walton can have golf courses, community golf courses, because they're hard to run. And you got it pretty much about break even, don't you? And, and, that, and that's good. And that means it's um, good enough that you're getting people golfing. So you should feel really good about that. But you do carry a few things that many other cities don't carry. Or if they do, it's always going to be controversial. We have the same thing in Pensacola where the city runs, I think, scenic hills or one of them or something like that. And there's always that debate on how long can we be in the golf course business. Um, capital follows talent. So it's how do, you, how do you keep that young people here and how do you keep your talent um, in your community. Um, civic engagement, you already do some with the academy. Um, we've recommended and, and we'll continue to work with you on telling, like we have a, who our speakers are coming, they speak, Seaside watches it and they try to get them to come to Seaside. Um, there's no reason why you can't 
piggyback on some of these. We have Charles Montgomery coming, who wrote the book Happy, the sort of about how do you combine a place and happiness in a city. We have a guy named Ferguson, who's the expert on achievement gap. We have Joe Riley, who built Charleston, coming into Pensacola. So this has been our biggest surprise in communities we go into, is people are hungry today for education. You know, they're hungry to learn how things work. Yesterday we had um, landscape architects in Pensacola talking about accessing the waterfront. We had 300 people at the event and we have about 5,000 that watch it on live stream, particularly when they know it impacts. I mean, you have some cool stuff going on here with the landing. We talked about new products and I guess our recommendation is to say, if you look at this, here's how you start evaluating where you go into. So, so what is the cost of downtown master plan as you have it? And you have a cost and, and revenue projection. What's the labor cost? What's the direct? Do you have the ability to manage and execute these big projects? Or do you have to add to your executive team here or to do some shifting around? Because all of a sudden, everything you've told me, if I added it up, all of a sudden you're going to have $90 million worth of new projects to manage, and, th and it's hard. One of the critiques that Pensacola got yesterday, which they deserved from outside people, was we have no one at the city that thinks every day how to drive, um, how to drive economic development because it gets split into different parts, different jobs, and so on. So, Michael, if you if you look at the like the the master plan, the landing, walk us through how you might look at that, would you please? Sure. Um. Yes, so if we look at the investment need, there's about $5 million. Um, a lot of that's grant funding, mm -hmm. fortunately for us. S and then uh, labor, all that's included. The labor and non-labor okay. is about $5 million. And then revenue that will be created, there's hardly any. Um, direct revenue, just because, no, but there, you know, it, it'll... Uh, but having been through this just this mm -hmm. week, what somebody would do is you take your empty land or your buildings around the landing and you can project you know sort of a projected analysis of what that will do now if it gets developed sure and 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 that hasn't been done for this project mm -hmm. um, but the indirect revenue will be more heads and beds yeah bed taxes sales taxes things of that nature and then uh, ability of the team to manage I mean Jeff and his group are already managing that, and we're really just improving the park. We're mm -hmm. not expanding it or anything like that. So there may be more events, things like that, but we actually have a contractor that handles a lot of the maintenance down there. Are, are there any empty, do you see any land around that will be developed? There, there is a piece about two properties over to the west that was purchased, I'd say, a year and a half ago that they've been trying to develop, I think, once the landing is renovated, that will probably spur some more interest. I would think so, So, because you bring a lot of people right. down. So if you look at the master, probably because you had outside people, just walk me through, if you don't mind, the master downtown plan. You okay. said that was a $30 million Yeah, Yeah, that, that is more, most of that is infrastructure. It's okay. rerouting roads, new uh, water, sewer, stormwater, uh, roads, sidewalks. It's basically a revamp of, of the interior infrastructure of downtown. Mm -hmm. And we're looking 30 to 35 million. And we are working with the TDC to get some funding from them. Of course, DOT to actually reroute Highway 98. And that's the, that's the key to that. And then once that all happens, then parcels can start <coughs> kind of conglomerating and you can have redevelopment in phases if you need to so we're not going to go in and tell existing businesses you got to get out of here and and redevelop they can you know redevelop as Th that as was the plan we went fit. over early on yes. right the city yes. council was voting on which scenario they yes. liked yes. is t is the company that you're using for this what's the name of them matrix design are they also coming up with some rev um, revenue are. projections and, and that all that's been shared with council and that that seems like a good project isn't it you're all, I think that's the game changer. I think that's the, I think if you want one transformational project, that's the transformational project. So to me, that's the high priority 
if I had to prioritize, but you're already doing the landing. What's a CTP? Can you go over that? Yeah, that, um, and Chris probably has more info on this, but that is a higher dollar project. You know, it's it's an old, old district or old park. Most of the buildings were 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, a lot of the property owners haven't kept kept up with the times. A uh, lot of vacant properties out there, I'd probably say 40 to 50% vacant. And we are having trouble getting tenants out there. Uh, mo now more and more because of some incentives we've offered and working with our EDC and other partners, we've gotten some, you know, we have our Boeings and Lockheeds and um, Dr. Shu and some local companies that are pretty big out there, but we, we need something to spur that, the interest in that. One disadvantage is lack of access to like an interstate. Yeah, it's um, a hard one. And so, so it's a hard selling point, but if the goal now is to really create an area that people want to be through streetscaping, uh, infrastructure work, we've talked about bandwidth, um, internet, right. things like that, because right now we have basically have one provider and that's it. And, uh, but that's, uh, that one is more of a longer term project. I would think so. Project. So, you're, so you're, one of the things we talked about when we got into this is the prioritization. I think what I'm hearing, and this is something you can use in the future, is your prioritization is pretty much set in your strategic plan. Let's finish the landing and make this master downtown thing work. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Michael, can I add on to the CTP? You know, we had, a, we had a good workshop. Staff brought in a lot of good information where a lot of the stakeholders were uh, bringing some good ideas to the table with that that aren't as expensive like the setbacks and you know changing some things in the district right. that might incentivize different developments to come and play right. where as we talk about priorities you know there's some things that we can do with the CTP uh, fairly recently uh, fairly soon without putting a huge investment into it while the the downtown master plan is the key yeah I, that's a good point because I think you can't do everything at one time and David's absolutely right. I mean, there are things, and, and Chris and his staff are already working on this, just minor land development code changes but for both got, have downtown. Have you got any new jobs since I was here last, <laughs> Chris? Uh, three new people started this week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, just land development code revisions for both downtown and the Commerce Park. I mean, th those would actually go a long way to help attract potential development or redevelopment. No, I, I think your strategy, you know, uh, people love big 60-page, 100-page big statements. I don't think it is. I think it's let's just get these one or two projects we got knocked out and not get distracted. And that's the other issue. It's so easy to get distracted because I'm sure you've got people knocking on your door all the time with, with ideas of spending your money. <laughs> well, and, and that's been our problem. Our, our problem has been lack of focus. Mm -hmm. We've always, you know, We've had trouble saying no, I guess. Right. So we always, you know, and we're a city on the, we're, pro, we're progressive. I mean, there's you no are. doubt about it. We're, you know, we're, it was very obvious, the League of Cities. The League of Cities I spoke at, almost everybody looks to Fort Walton Beach. I mean, you're, you're sort of the, the gold standard that they look at, as are you, Michael. When I talk to other city people, you're sort of seen as the city manager that they want their city manager to sort of uh, be like you. Be like Mike. Did anybody else ever <laughs> stick, take that one before? Um, so I think you, you have your, 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 your pretty much deal. I, I mean, y y if you look at your strategic goals, we've wrapped this. Safe and livable community in the citizens of Fort Walton Beach. And we believe you have to measure. And we believe your dashboard will measure those metrics. Your, your, your subgroup that's working. I love the fact you broke it down to four things. I thought that was really smart and they fit well. So your, your dashboard that you have now has to say, because that's really one, what your mission statement said. So if that's what your mission statement says, you've got to make sure you can measure. And um, Chief, are you on that, are you on that dashboard? The dashboard, yes. Yeah, I thought you might. Bo both chiefs are. Yeah, that's good. Because you've got to say, okay, what are the metrics we can measure? And then you've got that quality of life one. And I, I believe in the quality of life one, what that'll do is probably tell you how to communicate what you're already doing a little bit better. If there's a question, there might not be. I think people feel good. Fire always, you'll like the quality of life survey. I don't know what it is. I don't know if people like fire trucks or um, what it is. But, you know, you, you, you are a savior type mentality. 
So fire usually ends up really, really high. Police isn't as high because you know you're you're giving pe you haven't pulled anyone over and given them a ticket for not wearing a seatbelt, or you haven't done that. Not wrong or right. I'm just trying to lay expectations. The the police can department can be very well run, but the fire department might still be perceived a little bit higher just because of the nature of what they do. It's the same thing in, in almost any business. You know, In healthcare, they love nursing, but they wish the hospital food was a little bit better. I don't, and I don't care what, what you could do. But I think that's how we look at measuring that first strategy. So we can say, OK, we, we had a strategy, safe and effective. Are we really doing it? The next one is the goal is to maximize including tax revenue, growing population, and fix the stability. I think this is that master plan. Does, you know, that, does that master plan raise your tax revenue and does it increase your population? Because if it's not going to do those two things, don't spend 30 million bucks. I mean, is that fair? Yes. Because that's what you have to do to, to pay for it and sustainable. So uh, our goal with your strategic plan goal is to say to maximize what you're doing, but you've got to, and you're going to measure it by growing the population, increasing tax revenue. And that ties into even some of the stuff you're doing at CT. PI. Is your, is your stuff you're doing working? Um, support and talent growth, we, again, that's one of the things we say is population tax increase. And so if it comes, you named it. Have safe tax revenue. Now, I can't tell how many people I go, places I go to, they say we have a high quality of life, but they don't measure it, and they're losing population. Now, your population, why don't you walk through what, what's your population been doing over the last four or five years? It's been a pretty maybe 1% growth. Yeah, and you want to pop that up a little bit. You know, you want to get that up three, four, five, if you can, and you can. Your school district's pretty good, isn't it? It is. It and because that's a, you know, that's always the other issue is, is the educational <laughs> system there. Because some places you create the jobs, but they live somewhere else. You know, a great, great example is Springfield, Ohio. Um, they have a really, really good commerce park. They've created 1,600 jobs, but their population has gone down because people don't live in Springfield, Ohio. They live in other communities for some different, some of the educational reasons we talked about to come in there. And this is the one we, we, we talked about that we added as a separate goal. Maintain a well-talented and engaged workforce. So Terry, what is your turnover right now? Right now we're at 10.6%. Okay. See, I don't know city is, because cities normally, people stick in a city a little more than some other places for something you brought up early, it's called good benefits. So if the Pensacola just did their first employee engagement survey, and do you have some employees and some departments that are extremely unhappy, but they're there. And the reason they're not leaving, benefits. Which makes it harder sometimes, because sometimes you got some people you wish would leave, <laughs> but they're staying because they don't want to give up benefits and, and that's why you have to do this tax revenue because you can't you know when you say we, we try to you know keep, keep it flat you got to have set coming in the challenge is you can't keep it flat if you're employed what type of pay raises are if what would be your guess We're looking at that 2.5 percent increase brandy but if you took a market if you took a market because you know no longer can organization just say we're going to give a flat two and a half across the board. We're going to do one percent because there's some people in high demand. Correct. For example, cybersecurity type jobs. You can walk out today if you're if you're trained in cybersecurity, you can go anywhere in Northwest Florida and start at seventy-five thousand dollars base pay. Um, so those might have to increase. Police is something that's like you said more in demand right now. Which I think the key is we don't actually, that's why we're doing the pay and classification study because we don't actually know, we don't actually know exactly what our increase is going to need to be. So, so they, while they might average something, in the past have you done it more of a flat? Yeah, I can speak to that. For the past couple of years we've had on average 2.2, 2.3% 2 2 across the board mm -hmm. and now with the pay point HR comp study, you know, that, uh, we're hoping that that helps break us out a little bit. And, and you mentioned some positions, for instance, you know, and I got a handful that, and Mike can kind of attest to this too, I can't fill heavy equipment operators, I can't find mechanics, I can't find 
uh, water operators. They're just real tough positions because of the low talent pool, the competition in the area to fill those positions, and it goes with police and fire also. So we, we're going to have to look at those individually and see what it's going to take to raise the wages to make us competitive in order to attract and retain those employees. And, and MG knows this from the construction world. It's just yeah. quite absolutely amazing right now what's happened in, in you know, in construction. Yeah. Electrician, plumbers, which we also need here, and I've had them out on the market a year trying to fill some of the positions. And then your overtime goes way up, I would imagine. Yeah. Do you use agency? Every now and then we'll reach out if we need to, uh, where, where we'll contract a particular project or we'll um, kind of have the guys do the overtime to keep yeah. up with demand. So my, my message to the city council is you might want to be prepared that when this compensation study come out, you might have to make some bigger adjustments than you've had to make in the past. Some will be catch up. I mean, th there will be catch up. Because if you have done what you've done, there's probably some areas that have kept a little bit low and they might, not that you do it every year, but you might have to gulp and do it in a few target areas. Um, and the reason I say that's why this tax revenue and population is so vital, because you're gonna have to, that's gonna impact your budget, isn't it? Absolutely. What, what are you? Are you? What are you thinking about? I mean, you, are you waiting for the compensation study to? We are. It? We know one of our big issues is pay compression. Okay. And and that was an unintended consequence of our last Bingo. pay study. We brought the minimums up and adjusted pay scales each year with the cost of living. But what that did is those employees, three to eight years. Basically, if if you're a brand new employee, you're making the same as someone. That, that's a mistake know. most companies do, not just cities. Most companies they they panic and they react, so they know they got to pay a certain minimum wage or not minimum wage, starting wage. So they raise the starting wage, but if you don't handle compression, all your people you start losing all these people the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth year because now they re it just doesn't work. It Maybe actually as much backfires as the on the door you. does. Huh? They're making as much as the guy walking in the door does. Yeah, and it backfires on you a little bit, correct. or a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's, how many employees do you have? Right around 300. And, and what is your, your dollar, what is your compensation cost oh. in the budget? It's just the wages. Yeah, that's just like the wages. 16 million. Huh? 16 million. 16 million, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a hefty portion of our budget. Yeah, yeah. So, so a 5%, not saying this, a five percent is eight hundred thousand dollars, right? That, and I'm not saying you do, but just to put it in perspective, that's not crazy. When you look at where you're at, you're going to have to go find eight hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Where do you find it? That's that's brand new job. <laughs> <down there. laughs> is there a casino going up somewhere in Fort Walton Beach here? Where? I'm curious. I, I'm not trying to be jerky. I'm trying. I'm real curious. Go ahead, David. I would, I would love to answer that. I mean, I think it goes back to the, the, some of the non-essential services you, you were bringing up. You know, I mean, if, if, if we're going to look for that money from somewhere and look for trying to keep the uh, heavy equipment runners or the water quality people, we're not, we're not getting because possibly the pay. Do we find, if we don't go across the scale and give everyone the 5% increase, including your, you know, your, your uh, uh, folks that are running the uh, graveyard as well as the golf course. And I'm not saying that's it. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical. It's going to cost you more than 2.5. So. Absolutely. And this is probably like the first year that we've actually are going to have to really take a look at that because we've been fortunate. We've um, had a lot of our pension costs have actually decreased because we closed the plan nine years ago or so. So this will be the first year where we're actually going to have to really get creative in finding any additional monies for the wages. And, and I know what happens is, trust me, the place you always run is let's cut expenses, let's cut expenses. I'm a big believer the most best way to do it would be to get these two things better. Th that's really where you want to go because that's the long-term solution. Because it, it, let's just say, for example, you did stop doing some things you were doing. Well, the challenge is the next year you're going to face that same, same issue. So, so I, I, think your, I think your plan is very good. I, I, I think it's you got the landing you got to nail, and you got to nail the master downtown plan, and you got to um, keep your employees. It seems like, not to make it crazy, but simple is good, I think. Is it, would everyone, are you okay with that, Mike? I don't believe in cutting expenses. Huh? I don't believe in cutting expenses at 
that much. You, you know, all, all through, you try to grow your city, and then all right. of a sudden you, you're downsized. And you go in a death spiral. And whenever you start doing that, you're never going to come back with it. So it's you, you're definitely going to be creative, and it's going to take some challenges to do it, but I have no doubt that we're going to do it. Because th those They have to be done. There's right. no doubt it's got to be done this time. Kirby? Well, I'm looking at the issue as far as growing population. I agree. I agree with what you said that uh, the long-term goal is to increase population and revenue. The problem is uh, the geographics of where we're at. We're surrounded by water, and there's not too many areas to grow and bring in more population unless we start looking at other options as higher density housing uh, to bring in uh, more people to live in some of the areas that we already have. And I, I think that's one of the options we have to start looking at. Um, I would agree. If there's anything more than 100 percent, I, I would agree. And, and that's the, it's interesting because today higher density is acceptable by two age groups, young and old. Density, the, the up. And, you know, the beauty is you do have water. So people can go up. They don't have to be on the water, but downtown you could go up and you could have a, a pretty cool cool view of, of, of the place. And by the way, you, um, you did a great job. I, I brought this up in um, Okaloosa at the City League. You did a great job with you moved that hotel. Was that a, and I mean, it looks great. And it's so ironic. We started this, you had just moved it and the community I don't think was as positive right off the bat. But man, you showed it was a, it's really cool. But I think, Kirby, you're absolutely right. You've got to look at some plans that bring your density up here. But pay for, pay for everything you're talking about. MG? Just to piggyback Go on what Kirby's saying, and that's true. Well, we're going to have to have a two-pronged approach. We've got to do something quick and have a plan. So yes. we're going to have to be very strategic of what we can do now so we can start seeing the effects sooner than later. Yes. But then be able to sustain it you know, when we're out five to ten years down the road. I agree. MG, do you, any, you okay with where we're at? Yeah, I'm good with it. Uh, I think one of the things we have to wind up looking at is some of the older neighborhoods in the town, in the city, that are, they're sizable lots, and it may come to the point where the city has to purchase some of these older places to get the area we need for that more density to put something larger in. So it may have to cost some money to get this money over a longer span. Oh, uh, that's, I'm not trying to be a yes person, but you're an educated, you're such an educated group. Right. And one of the things is you have to look at your zoning. You have to look at what's been practiced. What's really cool when I go to communities today, that lot that used to be one house now has, you know, what maybe one one-story house has two two-story. I mean, all of a sudden you're putting more on a property, the, the apartments above garages. But the other thing I've learned when I wrote my book, you've got to control the property. And if there's vacant lots that you can get and then do some things to create that density because the wrong thing in the wrong place kills a city forever and ever and ever so I, I would agree with you to get control of some of this property to create um, some of the density David are you okay MG anything else yeah I think whether it's attracting talent we're heading in the right direction with these strategies and the goals but I think the key as Michael said is that is that moving the around the mound whether it's attracting talent, whether it's bringing in density. Um, we can't do the walkability. We can't do the density. I think it's very, maybe can't's not the right word. It's going to be much more challenging to bring in talent, to increase the top line, to make a walkability once that piece is, that canvas is. That's appreciate. your home. That, that's your. It's everything. That's, that's your. Everything. That's it. So as we continue to lean in on these strategies and lean in on these goals, which is, is amazing, that's the key to everything, yeah. and th that'll help a lot. Yeah. No, I would. Agree, Michael. Uh, any, you want to add anything? No, and, and that's why our focus has been downtown over the last couple of years. Without a core, the, you know, if you have a vibrant core, the rest of the city succeeds. Right. And, and, you know, every one of them hit it on the head. Yeah. And we've got to get density. That's our plan with downtown, you know, make minimum three-story buildings, mixed-use livable units up top, more rental units instead of ownership. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how the world's gone to rental <laughs> and, and for a while, and it might switch, but they're in demand right now. Mike, MG? Not that you only can do rental. You have to have a, you have to have a diversity. And I, I don't know anyway, I think we're saying, 
What we've learned in all these studies from everybody we've talked to is you have to diversity of housing, that's it. You don't want everything to look all condos expensive. Um, you have to have a diversity, which comes in size, comes in cost, those things. MG? Yeah, I think one of the things we have to be very careful of is you know, we do focus on the downtown. It's not going to be our only lifesaver. No. We have the rest of the city also. Yes. That it, like you were saying, making these different areas some may be the larger estates on the water, some of nice residential lots of half acre or whatever, but, but we do have to find those zones to get that density crushed yes. down, not just high rises downtown, but maybe Absolutely. on the edges of the, the downtown area to go to maybe five story apartments or something like that. Oh, well, I agree. And the nice part about that, MG, is those people still will be able to walk and bike and go to where they want to go, so I'd agree. And they'll be able to do that at a lower cost. Yes. I mean, to, to walk to the water is a lot cheaper than living on the water. Yes, a absolutely. You have a lot of advantages, and I know uh, for, for, you've got a good reputation. I think your quality of life survey, you're on the water. Um, you do have a lot of people drive by. Now, the problem is they're driving by, but you've got a lot of people driving by. David? And I'm glad MG mentioned that because I don't want it, uh, this to be as it's all about the downtown as far as make, being our only focus with density. There's a really neat thing going on. I imagine Chris could bring some more data to it, but because of the evolution of our downtown, the improving of our downtown, there's a, there's a district right next to it, uh, Elliott Point, that's every weekend there's houses being bulldozed and built. The houses uh -huh. being bulldozed and built. So. You know, we'll see some of that density increase in different parts of the city as that downtown, as, as other things continue to, to be revived. But we're seeing a lot of capital investment from the, the private you know, investors that are wanting to uh, meet the demand of housing. And it's... it's uh, yeah, we, 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 my wife and I live a mile and a... 1.8 miles from downtown. Mm -hmm. And so I, I will tell you the same... We're experiencing the same thing you're experiencing. It's like every week there's another little house or a lot of rehab going on, a lot of rehab going on right now, um, taking homes and fixing them up, and um, it's, it's sort of neat. But it doesn't have to be downtown. They mm -hmm. just want a vibrant downtown to be able to get to, drive to, and have fun in. And so that I, bleeds over into other districts of the city as the, as the downtown's attracting talent, more things, uh, more heartbeat is coming. You'll see the other districts continue to right. increase that density. Do you have co-work space downtown? We do not. Uh, um, Co-work space, if you're not familiar, is um, you have some buildings and you sort of create where somebody can rent an office, rent, it's really young people like them. It's a way to get in and maybe get a tour. I can, I'd love to have you come over to Pensacola. We have cities come in and maybe your council can come over. Not that we're the be all, end all, but I can just can show you, here's some co-work space you might want to look at. Um, you know, here's some things, because I think that's, the, I think you have to have a, and we'll share everything, by the way. We, we just, um, one of our employees who just finished up on the waterfront, we just assigned him to create an entrepreneur. What's the ecosystem for entrepreneurship? We got this out of Bentonville, Arkansas, and he's studying it. And we'll give you everything we got, because we're all in this together. But how to create that ecosystem for entrepreneurship, which is a little co-work space, it's some lease space, it's some startup money, it's some those type skill building. Um, yeah, and, and we, we ventured out, no pun intended, a few years ago to start a p or partner with a group to do a business accelerator Yeah, that did stuff like that. Unfortunately, we were too far ahead of the game. Bingo. The community didn't, didn't understand what we were doing, well, and so... I think it's a challenge you had. I mean, Fort Walton, truly, and I'm not saying this because I'm standing here. I go to a lot of cities. You, sometimes you can get too far ahead of the curve, and, and then you're, and the curve catches up to you. And so you have to re come back and do it. Doesn't mean it was wrong, but you come back and that's something you might want to look at with some of your come back and bring that to the table. The challenge is for, for to get cheap places, they go way out to pick up some cheap building that's available to put it there. Well, that's not where people want to be. <laughs> they, they want to be where the action is. Well, one of the recommendations of the Commerce Park plan is to have something like that out there, mm -hmm. which it would, it would actually be a perfect location. Okay. So that, and that's, those aren't that expensive right now. Um, so that, that's really what we wanted to say. I think you've got your dashboard done. You've got a way to evaluate projects. You've got a way to measure projects. And I think going back over, no, no, I think it's safe and livable. You're going to measure it. You got, you're maximizing your waterfront plan and landing with the CTP coming slower in a sequence process. Um, I, I, my, I'm, everything everybody said, you got to fill that space go up a little higher, 
um, everything you said is exactly what ha has to happen, and you're 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 geared for that. Um, and and I think the only thing that takes a little more time and effort than before is you're going to have to look at that whole compensation issue more sophisticated, more intentionally than you've ever had before. And the, the last thing to cover is I also also think as you get the quality of life survey, and you brought this up, Robert. Um, how you message the city is really important. There's a lady named Dottie DeHart. You know Dottie when she comes in. You might think about her coming in and, and do a workshop. She has a whole workshop on how to message your city, you know, how to talk about it, how to communicate it, rather than just a tagline. Because you have a lot of really good things going on right now. And so how do you, how do you message that? You know, and then once you start messaging it, and, you know, a U.S. News and Report named Pensacola the 15th most livable city to live in the United States, what, a week ago. And that's a pretty good, pretty good deal. Now, now how, do you, how do you message that? And anything you want to add? No, and I mean, really, that, that, was, that was my goal all along was to get to this point and uh, really hear from council on what, what the priority well, You're very are. fortunate. You've got a smart council. You've got a well-educated council, and you're on, you're on the same page. And that's really healthy. All right? Anything else? Kirby? Um, I know as we were talking, it seems like downtown master plan is on the top of the list. But uh, I, I can't help but remember when I was sitting there in, in, a, in a city council and we had Mr. Neighbors said, without the rerouting of 98, this plan is going nowhere. So now we're relying on an outside agency to make that decision, or how do we impact that decision to make that happen? Well, the first step was getting the feasibility study funded. And we had to basically give $50,000 towards a $750,000 study. DOT put in the rest. That alone showed the project, in fact, when they found out we were going to do, give the 50,000 match, they were beyond excited because most cities don't, don't offer that up. I mean, we, our offer was immediate and quick, a lot of them, when we did that. And so, and we've been talking to them throughout the Brooks Bridge design portion when they were doing the PD&E the last two or three years. We have pushed around the mound. You know, they even studied it as part of their second alternate study for the bridge. And so they, they are well aware of, of the seriousness of this. The TDC's come forward and said they'll donate or, or set aside some money for it. So, I mean, every, everything is coming together. Everyone realizes Highway 85 and Crestview and Highway 98 down here are the two, two main corridors, and they're the two bottlenecks right now that are basically keeping us from from becoming more successful. Um, what, what if, just out of curiosity, because as I've driven downtown, I'm still seeing positive changes. Mm -hmm. As MG said, you're seeing some of the neighborhoods already move with the, mount, with the road not being done. So I'm sure, what happens if that doesn't happen? If it doesn't happen, we, we've kind of already thought about some other alternatives to rerouting just directional traffic and I thought, I things think so like too. that to, you know, Brooks Bridge is going to be a huge um, benefit, especially when it goes over Santa Rosa Boulevard on the island. That's going to take away one of the bottlenecks. Um, and then we are seeing more and more private investment downtown. We're seeing more properties change hands. I can see that every time yeah. I drive through. Which, I don't drive through every day, though, so maybe once every month. But you see changes right, right. now. I mean, we're doing more uh, lean searches for properties than we've ever done, and that's an indicator of properties, you know, changing hands, which which is what we need. I, th I think Kirby, what I've learned is you got to play small ball. <laughs> Seriously, and and you got to do a lot of small ball. And if you can get the thing moved, that's the big one. But you got you got to do a lot of small ball. Keep playing. Keep hitting singles. And what you're doing right now is hitting a whole bunch of singles. Well, in the military, we call it a bump plan. you got to have your bump plan ready just in case. And I think, and, and I think you should, yeah, and I think the more you implement that, the more it puts pressure to do the other thing because you're, you're going to create that demand. It's sort of like, again, I, I talked Pensacola as I lived there. Everybody said, you can't do anything because we've got um, Bell Steel there. 
Well, now, we did so many things, Bell Steel's moving. Or you can't do that because you got a treatment plant there. Well, then you do a whole bunch of stuff in the, you know, you, you do the other stuff, which almost puts more pressure on the other stuff to happen. Or if you don't do it, they don't feel the pressure. And that's why when we rolled out the downtown plan, we have a short-term, mid-term, long-term implementation. The short-term are your quickest, least expensive you know, changes that we can make that are going to have maybe a small benefit, it's, but it's, in the end, it'll, it goes towards the bigger, bigger uh, picture. Michael, every, we studied so many cities lately, and almost every one of them underestimates all these small little moves. And then all of a sudden, they add up. You know, the two parking spots are gone, but they become something else. Or this turn lane changes for this, or the planter happens to this, or more trees come in here. Because you you know, you've got great waterfront. You just got to get people understanding where it is. I mean, first of all, I went to speak at that restaurant. I had no idea I had that behind it. You know, you've got, it just, you've hidden it. Yeah, and, and just, just so council knows, with a city like we are, we're moving forward. We're going to take risks. Some are going to yeah. pan out, some aren't. But just know that, you know, in the past, we've listened to the one or two, don't do it in my backyard or, you know, whatever you want to say it. I, I don't like that project. It's going to destroy my business or destroy my property. The one good thing we've had over the last few years is our council and the community as a whole or for the most part, has decided to move forward because these are decisions that could have been made 25 years ago and we'd, we'd be sitting here talking about something different, but they weren't because of the one or two that came out and said, don't mess with my property, and, but now. It's, when, I, when I go speak, somebody will say, Quint, your favorite part of your book is page 52, and it's consent versus consensus. You know, sometimes you just got to move forward. People aren't going to be happy. And then when it's done, a lot, some of them will wiggle because all of a sudden they see it get done, and now it makes a lot more sense. And, and the other thing is, as you go towards civic engagement, and they're very inexpensive. You might want to, very, I'm talking like four or $5,000. You might want to think about bringing um, the escape in just to do like a waterfront education because they bring some real, and then what they'll do is they do a little workshop because. I think the more you can continue to develop that landing component, I think that five million for what you're going to get out of it, it's going to pay for itself over and over and over again with the development around it. But those are some things. Well, thanks for the opportunity to get to know everybody better. I've appreciated it, and I'm sure we'll stay in touch. And please come and give us a tour, and we're staying in touch with Michael on a lot of things. And I think we should combine this um, economic entrepreneur project because I think we're doing a lot of research, and you might as well get get part of it because we're far enough apart. You're talking two different populations and, and two different thoughts. All right, anything else? Anyone, anyone else have anything to add? I just want to thank you, Michael, for uh, getting the Studer Community Institute on, on the strategic planning. I think it's been very beneficial for our leadership team um, and for ourselves as council. Um, and, and thank you for, for making uh, this recommendation and thanks for council for um, moving forward with this has been very beneficial and I think we're going to see a lot of prosperity from these conversations, goals, and strategies. So thank you. And thank you, Quint. No, oh, thank you. Great opportunity. I love you guys. It's been fun. I think one of the things I've gained the most out of this is, you know, it's, you have to lay out a plan and some goals. You, mm -hmm. you have to have that. But the side effect of it is it gets you thinking about so many other things. Uh, you know, future plans, you know, if this does happen, how can we tweak this a little bit? How can we tweak yeah. that? Because I've got so many thoughts floating around now that getting things narrowed down again is going to be great. I look at things differently. For example, our, our streets in Pensacola are 11 to 12 feet wide. That's insane. They could be nine. Now, we're not saying because that... driven a semi before <laughs> so, so, but I mean, in downtown, in the city, they could be nine to ten. So you could gain two feet with every lane. Now, that means what you have is you have the ability to put a very inexpensive bike lane in without really just, with, you know, I, I've looked at things entirely different myself going through all this process or, or same thing um, in our neighborhood, you know, in our, our neighborhood. It was really interesting when I first started because um, people came because they didn't want these take a lot and put two two-story homes on it because they liked their neighborhood. 
Well, now that's happening. And gosh, everybody's surviving. Everybody's living. And, and it seems to be working out. Um, but I, I look at things differently, too. So, so much differently, as I've learned, is going through this process on things like density, lane, parking, just a whole bunch of, um, you just look at things differently. I, I agree with you. Well, the best thing I got out of this, and, and it's, you got to have a plan. Uh, you got to know where you want to go, okay? And, and plans do change, but if you lay out a course of these are the goals that we want to achieve for the city, then we can lay those goals out, and then we sit down and we start doing our budgeting process. We're going to say, well, how does this match this goal? And then finally, you might see some things that we are uh, paying for that doesn't match to any of those goals, and it gives an opportunity to uh, discuss these things. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I even ran for this position is because I'm excited about where the city is going. Uh, when I heard about the the changes that are coming, uh, you know, I've I was I'm lucky. I lived most of my life right here in this city, so, and I've seen positive changes already, and I want to be a part of it. And I think this civic engagement is a good way to do it. Uh, I, I I like what we're doing with uh, our just getting the word out. Uh, Doug does a good job with the Kenwood neighborhood. He posts stuff on that all the time, and he lets us know what's happening in the city. And I just talked to him about my family, so that's a good area that we can continue uh, in, in doing the civic engagement piece. you got two wins coming that you want to maximize. One is the introduction of the dashboard, that, and people love that because you term it under accountability. You know, what do people really, many people want from their government? Accountability. So you are now creating a dashboard which creates accountability. People will like that, a way to measure. The second thing you're doing is a quality of life survey. And, and, and that should get a good play when it's done and rolled out because this is what you've told us. And um, so I think you got, Doug's got a big job ahead of him, but he's got two, two great opportunities to get the community involved because they just don't want to just come to come. They want to come for a very specific reason. Mike? Well, in the years I've been involved with it, I think the credibility has been established over the last three or four years by stubbing our toes, what we've done right and what we haven't. And I think the population sees that it's definitely their best interest that we are trying to progress and go with. Um, so I think building on that momentum, telling people what we're doing, what our eyes are seeing, what our thoughts are, and with the messaging is going to be one thing. And that, that may be the most important thing that we do is to get people involved so they know what's going on and to get them maybe involved in some of the, the small decisions, some of the small things that, uh, it's, well, there's some things that you know is, is not that important as far as if what you name it or what you, how you do it, but when they're involved in it and they have a piece in it, I think then they say, well, that's part of my town, which is, you know, that's what we wanted to realize, it's all their town to start with. Because <coughs> a lot of things that we do, it, it affects us just as much as them because we live here and we have businesses here. And you know, we with this credibility that we've established, we need to just keep going with it. Uh, we may have to make some tough decisions. We may have to ask for some things that people are probably not going to want to agree with. But to continue to go in that, it's going to be a, that's going to be the challenge. It will be with us too to make those decisions that we're going to do. Whatever you know, we're going to go with the course. We're going to you know say we're going to have to come up with this kind of money, or we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to eliminate this kind of service. But we need to just continue to do that but get the message out to the people. And, and Doug's done an excellent job. Um, I don't know how much more he can do or how well else we can continue to do that, but uh, I'm sure there'll be ways that they'll come up with on it. Yeah, there, there, um, I, I think too, if people want the safety, if they want the cleanliness, they've got to have employees. And I think if they feel they're, and that's where you measure good services. So I, I think your biggest chunk to bite will be the whole compensation study as that comes in. I, you know, I agree with you 100% there because the employees are the face of the city. Yes. It's not us. And it's those employees that are out there every day that are talking to them because they're, the, they're carrying the, the attitude, the morale, the feelings, uh, just the pride. Yes. And, and that's where we got to go. And that will be probably the toughest issue that we're going to decide this year, I can kind of assume. But uh, I think it's something that you know, we definitely can handle it and we're going to tackle it. Yeah, I think that's your, that's your sort of one, 
you weren't planning on, but it's probably went from here to here. You know, that's the most important. Employee, get, keeping your retention employees is more important than any master plan we've probably talked about. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a large amount, but it's really not in the big scheme of things. No. It's going to cost a whole lot more if you don't do it now. If we kick the can down the road again and again, yeah, you run into that compression issue, exactly. and you pay the price. I think the other thing too is with Doug here. Um, don't think that the you know Platka did a thing. They um, invited um, employ um, community members, or you didn't have to be, to give an idea, and give an idea what would bring you downtown. And if you turn in an idea, you've got they put it in like a, a contest, and you could win a thousand dollars. They had 110 ideas turned in. And then they announced the winner. Over 100 people showed up at the session. And then they actually broke them into groups. And um, even they were amazed at the community wanting to. And I think the reason is when people think something's moving in the right direction, just like Kirby said, just like Mike said, I'm sure MG and David feels the same way, is they want to be part of it. And Fort Walton's got a good buzz going on right now. I mean, I, I said when I spoke at the League of Cities, you were the, the star. Um, Fort Walton's got a really People know it's moving. They can feel it, and you can feel it. So, I, Mike, I think you're on it. And especially when they benefit from it, you know. I, yeah. I, I can never forget going to the Ice Pilots game, and you know, everybody likes watching the game, but more people are there for that two dollar fifty cent T-shirt they're going to fight over than they're shooting out the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can buy them for a couple of bucks, but yet, you know, they shoot eight or nine people out. And they just clamor all over. Yeah. You know, so it's it's they want they need to see a value. Yes. And sometimes the value can be very small. You know, it's just you know the value. Of and connecting values. back, yeah. connecting back, because you because you allowed us to do this. Because I think it's really going to be important this half cent sales tax you got to show them where it's going, how it's being spent, that it's being spent to retain employees, or it's being because that's yeah, what we learned from Donald Shoup when he came from UCLA. People are willing to pay even for parking if they see you're doing something good with the money that they're paying. And you know, it, we're doing a lot of that now, even by the free concerts, you know. It's just like the, the parade, you know, you have, they, it doesn't matter if you're from Fort Walton or where, it can be anywhere in the surrounding neighborhood, you can come to it. But they line the roads yeah. with beads. Yes. And stuff like that, so it, it's, it's cheap entertainment, you know, right. it's something where they can get together, the landing can do that, you know. As long as we keep expanding on that and, I think where the landing gives you, we were talking again to another community and say, we do these things on July 4th that just jam these places. We pay, like somebody said, a thousand bucks a minute for fireworks on July 4th. Well, you can do fireworks all throughout the year for a lot cheaper than that and still get a ton of people down. So I think it's continuing to program it, not just think it happens. And who does program your downtown for events? Yeah, I think programming, but I think the other thing I'd move way up is that constant programming. People want to come down and do those types of things. You know, we may be getting to the point where it's going to take additional person to do that. You know, it may be. That's the number one recommendation we make to cities, by the way, is don't make it part of someone's job because then the other stuff sort of gets priorities. Have somebody that wakes up every day saying, that is my full-time job. Programming. And, and that, that may be where we're at, you know, like some of the planning that we have to do, you know, some of the downtown planning. It may require a, a plan or a grant writer or something. I think, I think you're to that point to go to the next level, you're going to have to, like somebody said, spend some money to make some money. All right, Michael, well, thank you. Well, does staff have anything now? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Brandy would. Um, well, just following up with all the, the plans you know, that we've been discussing here, and, you know, we've had a lot of um, activity already you know, on, the, on the permitting side, on the redevelopment side, you know, infill, um, tearing down old houses, rebuilding, you know, new, um, splitting lots and, and developers finding, you know, everywhere they can. Um, you know, I think we've had a lot of, you know, energy in you know, positive direction. Um, I think, you know, moving forward, we can definitely take that with these master plans. Um, and, you know, looking at, you know, you know, looking at the code, making those changes, you know, the low hanging fruit, all of that. Um, and, I think uh, too, and you, to. MG brought it up, I think, and you brought it up. There's certain places you, if you want, you've got to go high. Mm -hmm. You For can't sure. build a one story. And I see cities all over saying, no, mm -hmm. if you're here, you've got to go three stories now. Because that land is too p valuable to only have a one story on there right now. Yeah, for sure. We're seeing a lot of that. So, 
you know, tourism side, we've had two new hotels in the last year, two more under construction, and another one that just came in for a pre-application meeting this week, right along Highway 98, you know, right down here. So, you know, we have a lot going on, and uh, excited for, for sure. It's just around the room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, very excited uh, about the strategic planning process this year, um, and and what's happening. And, and I've had some pretty uh, some pretty direct conversations with with Michael about prioritization and, and putting things in order where they need to be and should. So uh, it's very promising. Uh, we got a great council and, and leadership. So I'm, I'm looking for some great things to to, to come out of that this year. As all of you know, we have some issues um, with the fire department trying to do a little bit more with our capabilities there. That's something we'll share when we get to uh, the, the budget process in a, in a few nights. But, uh, okay, Terry? I think, Brandy, you spoke already, didn't you, Brandy? Yes. <laughs> get, that, get that feeling. That's my, my wife. Same look my wife gives me periodically. <laughs> or lots. Yeah, so, so I agree with you, Mike. We talked about it today in terms of trying to um, hang on to our employees. I think it's getting um, difficult because of the competition and uh, the fact that we, we need to deal with the compression issues. There's just some positions, you know, and I talked about it earlier, the mechanics, the police, the fire. They're getting really difficult to fill. And even when we do get a good pool coming in, um, my numbers are low. So for police, for fire, when, when we do get applicants that come on board, I just don't have the numbers anymore. So we may be able to put an eligibility list together and that may last three months and we have to go out and do it again because the quality of the applicants just aren't there anymore. So I think the pan class study is critical. I've got, based on information on our exit in interviews, they're but the pay's tough. The benefits are tough and they would stay. They absolutely love working with Jeff Peters. However, I can make, a, make additional money by going over to Panama City or Pensacola. So that has to be addressed and the paint class study is going to be critical and we've got to get creative and find a way to, you know, to, to hang on to our employees. And you don't want to have to hang on to people you don't want to hang on to because you don't have the numbers. And whether we like to admit it or not, there's a subconscious thing when you can't recruit people you start hanging on to some people longer than you need to hang on to, or you lower the bar on who you hire because you get desperate. Dad, Daniel? Um, I think the revenue stream uh, conclusions that we came are, are right on. I know it, it's, it's for us, fortunately, it's not just tax base, but um, you know, is one of the, the few depart departments, if not the only department, you know, we, we actually sell a product and we sell water. Bingo. So, so increasing, you know, water sales, you know, well, you're really consumption important. area, and, and as well as our solid waste, too. And I think I'd be real careful, Daniel, because you're a revenue-producing department, and you can be sucked into the bureaucracy of the rest of the city. And I think you've almost got to be freed up to run like a business that's out there to get revenue. Co correct. And I think, I mean, we are. I mean, we're... Because, um, you know, they, they, I'm just saying, in many yeah. cities, you get locked into bureaucracy yes. and it kills you. So, so I, I'm lucky, you know, I, where I'm at, I'm lucky enough to not just be a city, but we're also a utility. Right. So, so we have a whole, you know, other group of, of challenges and support and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, increasing the sales, like Chris said, with the hotels and stuff they have in, we just, we just want to put ourselves in position to be able to provide and have the ne necessary, you know, capacity to serve everybody or, or, or all these big grand voice ideas. Pensacola <laughs> Energy saves Pensacola on a regular basis. Well, and, and Daniel brings up a good point. We've had a council and a fiscally sound utility program and solid waste program over the years. We've ra increased the rates when we needed to increase the rates because we are, we're providing a product. Yes. And, you know, people can control what they use. Um, we have neighbors who aren't in that position. No, no. You know, it's they're using general fund dollars to subsidize utilities. Well, what that does, it keeps your bottoms high. You know what I'm saying. When you go through rough times, it, I say Pensacola Energy has been a savior to the city of Pensacola, that revenue stream, many, many times. So, yeah, we, we've been in really good shape. So. Uh, you have, that's why you're in such good shape now to take it to the next level. You're, you're not a turnaround. You're taking it to the next level. Chief? Just to give some broad comments on some topics that you brought up. One, like MJ talked about, is the development and the growth, and you spoke a little bit about. 
down in South Florida, there are cities like Aventura and Sunny Isles that you thought were built out. I mean, they were similar, mid-sized cities. And you're like, they could never put another building in. Every single day, there's another crane somewhere, something else being put in. And like you said, some lot is either subdivided or bought or sold. And they're always growing. And it's kind of either you're growing or you're dying. It's just like a living organism. Either your cells are growing or they're dying. It's one or the other. There's no status quo. If you're status quo, you're basically dying off and falling back. So I agree with you wholeheartedly with that. As with development, Michael brought it, brought it up a little bit, how you got that one or two percenters. A lot of times with developments, if it's done smartly, and when I first got here, I heard about the neighborhood Walmart store that was going to go up there on Eglin Parkway. People think about development and they think about increased traffic and trips and everything else, but you put a neighborhood grocery store in, you're really not creating more traffic trips because instead of driving to the Publix that's a little bit further south or a little bit further north, you're going there for the grocery store. So if you develop new tax growth without doing a lot for traffic, which is our biggest concern. And you talked about population, and it's right there on the slide too, about population. I think population goes both the residents that sit in the seats, but population should be a more broader term in industry, business, commercial development, yeah. and everything else. So you gotta look at population in a global term. That's a good point. I think in your dashboard, you can even break that down, different population segments. And then to go with what Terry said a little bit about recruiting for police, and it probably holds true for fire, we try to recruit person to person. I mean, and we have to go out there and basically drag and pull people into the police services. Mm -hmm. And at lunch, we were talking about how you hear these stories that back in the, in the older days where they'd have lines around the block to come to police and fire services, and places would do lotteries to get down to a small applicant pool to process, those days aren't there. I mean, we now go and we actively recruit and we kind of steal from the sheriff's department or we're going up to the college and we expend a lot of effort to bring one or two people in, one or two people in, and we bring them in like that by one sometimes. So it's a big process to try and get people to come in through the police and fire. And one of the things we have is that it's a long process to come in too. And we a lot of times lose people through the process because then they find a higher paying job or a better paying job somewhere else. So I have to wholeheartedly agree with Terry and I really think the city is going in the right direction and that through proper growth, proper management and increasing the revenues that we can get a lot of the stuff done that we're looking to get done. Thanks. Jeff, you, you uh, Jeff, I want to compliment you. I think when you sit and you hear things about services and you hear, you know, you know, what's necessary and what's that your maturity through this whole process has been really admirable to allow open discussion like this and no defensiveness or anything like that so i really admire how you've handled this whole process thank you i i, I guess <laughs> no no it is no no it is I, I actually i have a question for you um you want to buy a golf course in lake mills <laughs> is that it <laughs> sure um from the sports uh tourism side of it you know mm -hmm. uh, we, we're going on our fourth year uh, at the rec center, we built a 10 athletic complex, 10 field athletic complex, right by, and a rec center. And it's we've had each year the numbers are getting bigger and bigger with teams and tournaments mm -hmm. and stuff. And the public works buildings are moving down uh, the street, uh, which which opens up um, our athletic complex. We submitted a um, part of our half cent sales tax. One of the projects was uh, to add some more athletic fields to bring bigger soccer tournaments and stuff mm -hmm. there, which ties in there. What's your thoughts on, you know, we talk about population and tax revenue. Do projects like that, the different cities you've been to, the ones I've seen, they, they, there's new construction and hotels and stuff, seems like they're going around those complexes, but I, you've been to a lot more cities than me. I'm just I, curious. I, well, I, I think, first of all, it's a competitive nature of who else is doing it and who else is around it. Because, as you know, sports tourism has really, it's been on steroids the last 10 years. I mean, it's not a... It's not a cottage industry anymore. It's a real serious industry. And I think you're, you're in a pretty good location because Panama, you're in between Panama City and Foley. And those are the two people that got real serious about it, don't, don't you think? I mean, Pensacola looked at it and then didn't move and Foley put $40 million into a sports complex. They don't even allow their recreation people to use their new sports complex. I don't know if you're aware of that. They built a $40 million sports complex just to attract tournaments, and they don't allow residents to use it, which makes sense because they've also created great places for residents. So they didn't run into that, that issue. Um, you know, you look at the market, you look at the study, I think the challenge is with the tourism. You're going to get a different type of hotel, which isn't wrong or right, but you're going to get a mid to low paying hotel because people aren't going to come stay at a Marriott. 
they're going to look at a certain hotel. They're probably going to track a lot of franchises around it, just the nature of the beast, right. pizza. So it's, it's not wrong, but, but you've got to say, are we, right now, you're, you're in the, and you're growing methodically. Um, and that's, I would still test it. So I, I think the question is, can you compete with Foley or Panama City and put that much money in it? Or do you keep doing what you're doing? Is get a place, you know, the soccer that keep coming and you keep, I, I would say you keep growing it incrementally. That would be my guess. And we just did a study with Crossroads. You, you know, they do a lot of these studies. And it's just a very competitive market. Now, I don't know how, what happened with the hurricane. That might have knocked Panama City out of this for a while. Could it have? It, it, it did. So I imagine you're going to pick up a whole bunch. And I'd pick them up like crazy and try to get people to have great experiences while they're here. Anything else, Jeff? That's it for me. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. Appreciate it.